Hi everyone, hope everyone is doing well. We're really, really sorry for the late start. How's everyone feeling today? Let me know in the in the comment section. We're really sorry for um, starting really late. We had some technical difficulties. Um, but yeah, my name is Teresa Beckley and I am the Education Officer at Church Union. Um, I've got with me Comfort, who would introduce herself now. Comfort. Hi everyone, my name is Comfort Abadje and I'm your part-time international students officer. Thank you so much, Comfort. Um, it's lovely to have you all here today. And without further ado, we'll go into the student presentation. And we've got Chido here, who is a student like yourself, and she's been here for some time. And she'll be able to share her experience, you know, being in Swansea so far and how she's found it and the opportunities that have been made available to her. Go on, Chido. Are you able to share your screen? Yeah, sure. Um, hey, everyone. So I am the Chilo that she is speaking of. Can you all see my screen? Yes. Great. Wonderful. So thank you, Teresa. Um, it's great to be here. Uh, I know it's under very weird circumstances, but thank you for showing up. It's always um, very exciting when people actually turn up for these events, because uh, it means that we're not just talking amongst ourselves. So thanks, everyone. Um, so I am a final year accounting and finance student. I've been in Swansea for about four years now. Uh, so I like to think that I'm a Swansea veteran. Um, today, I'll just be talking to you about my story, uh, some of my experiences that I've had at Swansea and why knowing your story matters, not just for right now, but for your future as well. Ooh. Great, there we go. Sorry, everything wasn't working um, as Zoom does. So for my story, um, I'm from Zimbabwe. I'm actually wearing my Zimbabwe like country on my neck today, representing. Um, so I left Zimbabwe in 2017, born and raised there, grew up for you know about 18, 19 years there and then had to move to Swansea for university. Now, as we all know, the application process was just absolutely daunting, having to go through the visa application, trying to make sure I had gotten my English language test results and making sure that everything was in place before coming to university. Thankfully, Swansea University was very involved in the process of me coming to uni. So I found it a little bit easier just because we had that assistance. Um, the picture that I use in the background is actually so I don't know if you guys do this often, but back home, we have like going away parties. Um, so this was mine. We went to a place called Lomboshawa, which is just like basically like beautiful scenery and great rocks. So my friends and I went there. And what was a hard thing for me was leaving my family and my friends. So my nuclear family, all of them are at home. And a lot of my friends are either at home or in different countries. So that was an experience for me that was a, a little bit daunting. I was going to a place where I wouldn't know many people, didn't know what was waiting for me. Um, but thankfully, uh, I knew just a few people, just enough that when I arrived, um, you know, I could have a friend who took me out to watch a movie. I think like the second day I came. So that was really nice. Um, but arriving in Swansea, what some of you may have discovered would be a culture shock. I know that I'm not alone um, in saying that we all experience different um, things and you know the difference in culture from home and here that was definitely something that I experienced that was new one thing for sure was the weather I, I I don't know if it's just me but I come from a sunny Zimbabwe and moving to Swansea where it's gray and it's wet like today it's sunny and it's I'm grateful so grateful um, that sun, uh, Swansea is showing us its best side today but that was one thing that was particularly difficult for me was adjusting to the weather um, another thing was just missing hearing my language. I don't know if you guys feel the same sometimes, but just being able to speak in your language and to tell jokes in your language and just, you know, understanding different humor as well. So I think that was something that I discovered while adjusting. Um, I know for my friend, she's from China and she said that she actually faced language barriers when she arrived. And I thought that was you know, so true to so many international students that when you come, it's not just a difference in culture, not just a difference in you know the kinds of foods that we eat, but also language. You know that's something that defines you from the language that you speak at home. So, I spoke to her about it, and you know we became friends. And 
you know, thankfully for her, she was able to meet other people and become friends uh, with people from her home as well and actually interact with other British students. But I know that's something that as international students that we can sometimes suffer with is just that language barrier. One thing for me being black, um, I became a minority when I crossed the border. And what that meant for me was I left a country that was predominantly black people and came to a place that was predominantly white people. And that was definitely new for me, just even balancing out what it meant to be a minority and how that would shape um, not just my university experience, but my career as well. And that's how um, I got exposure to different career networks and different employability schemes that I would need to take part of, just because for international students, we have to work a lot harder than um, a lot of other people sometimes. I don't know if any of you are like me, um, Zimbabwe is not necessarily always the most peaceful place to be. Um, and so even when I was here, there was a coup that happened in 2017, um, you know, fights and protests broke out in my home country. And I know recently we had um, the NSARS in Nigeria and, you know, the wars in Azerbaijan. So there's so many things that happen internationally that can affect us as international students when we're here at university. And I'm very aware of that. And Hopefully everyone else within the university system is aware of um, things that like that that happen at home as well. But thankfully I was able to find community. And one place that I found a home um, was my church. And another place that I found a home was the Zimbabwean society and the student ambassador scheme. So getting involved in all these different aspects of university life really helped me um, settle in. It really helped me meet different people from different cultures. And I found that it wasn't just me going through um, all these feelings of missing home and missing important events. I've had family, have children. My own brother got married and I was here because of the lockdown. So, you know, I think for international students, sometimes we can feel isolated from our family just because life doesn't stop because you're in a different place. Um, and that's something that I can definitely relate with, thankfully, because of all the societies and the sports that we have at the university, I was able to get involved. Um, some of the things that I've been able to do, I was vice president of the Investment and Finance Society. I've been the fundraising officer of the Student Ambassador Scheme before. Um, and that's actually led me to where I currently am, which is finding my voice. So I've taken part in a lot of volunteering in the last four years since I've been at Swansea. And one thing that has really caught my heart is diversity and inclusion. And the reason why I've started to work on different DNI projects is because I truly believe that as minorities, we aren't only excellent, we aren't only providing different perspectives, but we are worth it. <laughs> um, we add value to not just the world, but definitely to higher education. And it's important for us to be represented and to have our voices in the rooms that need to be spoken of and you know I know Teresa is also working really hard to make sure that our voices are heard on a platform that can actually make change and that's some of the things that I've been um, doing for the last six months I suppose um, especially with the Black Lives Matter resurgence that happened in America and then all over the world so some of the things that I've been doing is a video series with my friend Natasha who's also from Zimbabwe uh, just giving students international students minority students a platform to speak about their experiences and speaking to lecturers alike and alum hopefully um, just about their experiences at Swansea and what that means what that has meant for them and how they've been able to cope because I feel like the more we talk about it the more advice will be given the more opportunities for success that we'll have and the reason why I say that is because I think your story matters. In fact, I know your story matters because it's what helps your future. It what, it's what shapes the kind of path that you'll walk down um, in your life. And one aspect that I discovered very early on in university was employability. Now, I know for a lot of you international students like myself, home uh, doesn't necessarily provide you with the biggest uh, job opportunities. I know countless stories of students who have studied abroad and gone back home and they're sitting on their degree because the job market, there just aren't any jobs. So for a lot of us, it's 
it, it's getting the experience that we need to make sure that after we get our degree, we have the experience necessary to qualify for these jobs, to make sure that we, you know, make an earning and actually begin to start your career. Um, even if it's going back home and, you know, working with the family business or starting your own thing. I know Kelly likes to talk about enterprise and, you know, it's such an important thing for us to, to leverage all the experience that we can at university. Um, you can see over there on the right that I've put different connections and these are just few among many that you can definitely engage with. I put Swansea Employability Academy there because they are number one, top, should be everyone's primary source um, to go to for career experience and advice because they are an amazing group of people um, with a wealth of knowledge and great networks, not just within the university, not just in Swansea, but all over the world. And I think that's so important for us to engage with as international students. Personally, they know my name now <laughs> because of the amount of times I've gone to them um, just asking about advice. Um, so the others there that I've written down, SEO London. So they work primarily with um, minority students and just from abroad and help them get experiences, not even just abroad, but also from the UK just to get experience. Um, they hold CV workshops as well, similar to the Black Young Professionals Network, which is the BYP, Bright Network, Target Jobs, all of these amazing resources that you can get involved in. And it's not just helpful to do because you get the kind of lessons that you need to know before entering the job market, but it also trains you in terms of how to attend um, assessment centers or what you can do and how you can present yourself in interviews. One thing that I've definitely leveraged from this is building a network. I think that is something you'll hear in Swansea over your tenure here. And it's such an important thing to remember is that you're essentially just meeting so many different people in one area and you have the greatest advantage to meet different people from different places. If it's not just for the holidays where you can, you know, go to Italy perhaps because your friend is from there, then definitely for the business acumen that you can learn from different pools of people. I attended this one webinar over summer um, that was done by SEO London and the speaker was actually Swansea alum and her name is Jude um, and she's uh, over there and she actually works for the UN and she said something that really really struck a chord in me and she said package your uniqueness now it struck a chord with me because she herself is an international when she came over to Swansea she was from Saudi she is from Saudi Arabia excuse me and she was just talking about how important it is to know your story, to harness the, the things that you've learned, the perspectives that you have coming from where you come from so that it tells your story in a definite, unique way. Um, you know, I know for myself being in accounting and finance, I remember growing up in Zimbabwe in the 2008 crisis and I remember buying ballet shoes for a million Zim dollars and a week later it was, you know, I bought gum for that same amount and that was preposterous to me. You know, obviously now I know that's inflation and economics, but that's the kind of exposure that I've had that's led me to where I am now and that's the kind of story and power that can be behind knowing your story. One thing that I mentioned just now was your perspective and why that's important for you whilst you're at university is because you can get, excuse me, engage with the university and engage academically as well. It's so important for you to have um, that exposure and that that one to one conversation with your lecturers, with members of staff, just engaging with your with your studies, not only because they'll provide recommendations for you after you leave, but they might give you a job. Um, I know that from my own experience being a student ambassador, I was attending an event and I happened to have a conversation with, um, I think she was head of marketing at the time with the university. And I was just talking to her about some of the things that I was struggling with at university and trying to find a job as an international student. Her friend happened to own an accounting firm. She said, hey, I'll speak to my friend. You can maybe intern with them for two weeks just so you can get the experience. They were over here in Swansea bang, I, I sent in my CV, cover letter, got a job for two weeks. So, you know, that's the kind of support that you have within the university if you put yourself out there, if you network and, you know, meet the right people talking about your perspective. Because that experience for me came because I was telling her that it's so difficult as an international student sometimes to find those jobs. Um, I mentioned earlier, joining a sport or a society can really help um, not only to meet people, but just to find 
um, something that makes you unique. Uh, it's something that you can add to your CV. Um, I know employers always look for anything that gives you um, a leg up above people when it comes to being part of teams or being a leader. You know, it just always helps to give examples and to actually have the evidence that you were engaged um, with the university experience. I will always be biased towards the student ambassador scheme, being a student ambassador for three years now, but becoming an international student ambassador is one way that you could get involved or becoming a student representative with the students union. That's just, you know, small ways that you can get involved and give back to not just the community that you have within Swansea, but to your students uh, overseas as well. It's a way that you can speak to your people from your country and tell them, you know what, I'm at Swansea, this is the kind of help that they're giving me. Maybe you can come over to Swansea as well. Um, now I put Dr. Sharma here, who some of you might know, um, and he is part of the research team that's recently developed the first, uh, the world's first, I think it's COVID-19 vaccination patch, if I'm not mistaken. And, you know, he's a minority and he's doing excellent things. And I just put, this is the kind of impact that we as minority students have, not just in Swansea, but in the world, like it's the first of its kind in the world. Um, that's the kind of impact that we can have as international students, as minorities from different places. Um, so I just want to encourage you that your perspective really is important. Now, what about right now? I know we're in the middle of a global pandemic. Some of my friends call it a panini. Um, there's so many different experiences that we're having right now just because it's such a tough environment, but stay connected. One thing that I've learned over the last seven months is be virtually visible. And for students, what that means is if you're in an online seminar, an online lecture, just switch on your video you know, turn off your mic sometimes, speak to the lecturers, you know, they have probably 20 plus black screens looking at them. So, you know, engage with them. It's one way to get to know your lecturers now. It's one way to meet other students. Um, I had a student, uh, a, a colleague of mine that I, I didn't know, we just kept being put into the same breakout rooms every Zoom session. And we had an on, I think it was an in-person workshop last semester. And I recognized his buzz cut above his mask. And I remember just looking at him across the computer labs and I was like, are you Sam? And he was like, oh yeah, are you Chino? And we actually got to talking and this semester we actually are in a group together for a group project. So I definitely encourage you to reach out to some of the students that you see in your seminars. Um, another thing that I would say is stay in contact with your friends and family. It is so easy to you know, lose touch because of just the amount of Zoom that you have to engage with and all the independent study that you're going through. I, I feel you. <laughs> I know what it's like to, you know, reach the end of your day and be tired of Zoom, but I want to encourage you to stay connected to your friends and family. It's, you know, I don't know about you, but I found it really refreshing at the end of the day to just call my friends or speak to my, my family and find out what's happening at home or, you know, what has my cousin done or, you know, what's happening with the sports teams back home as well. Just really staying involved like that. Um, it, it can sometimes lift your morale. I would also say prioritize your health and your studies. Um, it's really important right now to make sure that you are not just physically okay, but mentally okay, emotionally. Um, if you're a spiritual person, that's also something that might help and boost your morale and be able to keep your well-being um, just in a good place, really. Um, I've also put um, resources here uh, or the email addresses of International Campus Life, Welfare at Campus Life. Uh, they're all great, you know, all the, the team, the staff that work for them and really are there for us as students. They're all amazing. Reach out to them if you ever have issues, if you ever feel like you need um, that extra assistance. I myself, um, not necessarily during COVID, but I repeated my second year and I needed all the, all the support I could get. And, you know, not just welfare campus life, I, you know, had counseling, I had my student experience officer within the School of Management speak to me, she actually spoke to my mom um, as well, and, you know, gave that reassurance that Swansea was definitely there to support me. So as international students, I would really encourage you to reach out to the different avenues that we have to engage and to make sure that we stay okay while we're at university. I always say this, um, to students when I speak to them. And I would say this when I gave campus tours or different presentations at open days is you always get out of life, whatever you put into it. One thing my father always says to me 
in fact, he said this to me um, when I first came to university. He said, Chido, one thing that you can't guarantee is whether or not you will have a degree in four years. But what you can guarantee is that four years would have passed by and you determine the kind of person that you want to be at the end of that. You determine how you will come out of that experience. And I had to make the decision myself about whether I was going to come to university and leave with grades on a piece of paper or leave with knowledge that would make me an asset to a company, leave with the experiences that would make me a representative of the things that I believe in, because that's ultimately what matters as people is the kind of impact that we leave on the the you know, peers that you have, the circles of influence that you have. And so I remember, you know, first year of uni, you want to cram everything. That's how you did it in high school. You know, you were able to pass that way. But eventually it dawned on me that, you know, I'm going to have to actually showcase the fact that I, I've learned something for the last three or four years. And it, it, it just made me realize that the university experience isn't just for me to make friends, to network, but also to improve on myself to invest in myself, to invest in the, the reason why I came to university, not necessarily to just find a job, but to make a difference in the fields that I've chosen to make a difference in. So I would encourage all of us, you know, whether it's you meditate, you journal, you exercise, whatever it is that makes you become motivated to engage with your studies, to engage with your personal development, because university isn't just a thing for your career, it's for your whole life. Um, so thank you so much for listening to me. Um, I know it can be a drag sometimes, but thank you so much um, for listening to my presentation. Stay proud of where you come from. Remember your roots because one day that will become the tree that you become in your life. Thank you, everyone. you have spoken fire there thank you so so much you know for you know that presentation it was really lovely just hearing from you you know I was literally having goosebumps girl I'm so proud of you so proud of everything you've achieved I think you are a testimony to say you know you can do anything you really set your mind to and can we just give a special shout out to Chido's dad he's here and he put in the chat <laughs> don't worry don't be embarrassed we're so proud of you and I'm sure he's proud of you as well thank Thank you so much you know for that wonderful presentation so we'll move on now to post-graduation and employability um Zdravka would be you know presenting on this and you know would give us a lot of nuggets that we need to know on you know what we need to do after postgrad sorry after graduation and the tips we need to you know be employable uh sorry i'm just rambling on now Zdravka take the floor Oh, you're on mute. Yeah. Okay. Hello, everybody. Um, welcome from me as well. It's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, before I just continue, Teresa, could you let me share my screen, please? <clears throat> And just to say what a fantastic speech from um, Chido. It's been um, amazing to hear that experience. And you've paved the way. I mean, you've just did, did my, my talk for me, most of it. So <laughs> big thanks. <laughs> uh, maybe next time we could, um, you know, both of us can, can co-present. It's, it's great to hear your experience. Okay, so I'm still not able to, to share my screen, but I'll keep trying. Yeah, try and, Yeah, I'll try again. Yes. Here we go. Okay, so um, I'm Zdravka, one of the careers consultants in Swansea Employability Academy, and um, I, I was invited today, and it's my pleasure to talk to you more about your um, opportunities after graduation. Okay, so just a couple of things that I will cover. It's um, how to enhance your employability. We already heard from Chido a number of ways. Um, I can go and um, discuss those in, in more detail and provide you with more information about how to access that, those. And of course, what are the options? What's next after your degree? And um, where and who can help you? There's a lot of support here and um, I'll give you all the details so that um, 
you know where to come and who to contact. Okay, so um, what are the employers looking for? I think it's very important to start with with that, so that um, you have the awareness of when when you're gaining those skills and attributes. How does that match what the employers out there looking for in their graduates? So you would see a, a range of skills as, as always. The top ones are working in a team, being able to solve their their problems and to provide solutions, being able to um, um, to um, work with, with numbers and to analyze data, to communicate efficiently, to apply um, and to work well with technologies. But above all, and here in the center, you would see is that positive attitude and mindset. This is what employers lately have been um, highlighting that it's one of the, the key things that they're looking for in their graduates. So, if there's something that um, you know you could think and um, address at your application forms and particularly at interviews, it's um, your your outlook, your positive outlook, your can-do attitude, and the growth mindset. Okay, and how to realize that? Um, you, you can get to that point by reflecting more about yourself. And in Tito's presentation, she talked about your uniqueness to package that. It's very similar. In order for you to be able to package that, you need to understand that, to be aware of how unique, how special, and what are the things that you could offer these employers. And the process to get through, through to that is to look at what is it that you really want and what are you really good at? What are you not so good at? Um, and also how others perceive you. Sometimes we're very humble. We don't realize all these great things that we have achieved or those qualities that we, we, can, um, we have within us. And having a trusted other, somebody who can really share that um, with us really helps. And of course, um, establishing a plan, um, um, uh, uh, highlighting for for yourself and establishing ways that, that you would like to go to go forward. So self awareness is one of the keys in your career development. Without that self awareness, you wouldn't be able to to progress further. You would need to be aware of all your skills, of all your qualities, of all your knowledge, so that you can write your CV. You also would need to know um, what you, you have learned from your degree and your experience to be able to complete your application form. You would need to be able to know how good you are and how you match the company's values um, at an interview, for example. So the first step in whatever you do is the moment to look at yourself and to become more aware, um, to realize those great qualities that you have and to package them to be able to articulate them through to others and to employers. And um, this is uh, not just um, the association of graduate recruiters, but amongst all the, um, the employers, there's that understanding at the moment that graduates don't seem to know to be able to do that. They're lacking in that. And through the students that I speak to and the graduates even, I have observed. So something here to, to pay attention to and to make a note is that um, you know it could be that lack of self-awareness and that's why I'm addressing this as an issue um, or it could be that you know people uh, haven't been exposed to, to opportunities um, but that's one key to um, you know to, to your future for your future steps is to think about to stop and reflect and to really understand for yourself is what is it that you can bring to the organization that you're applying to to really realize that well for yourself and to be confident then uh, to, com to communicate it through to them. Okay, moving to the next point. And there's some suggested ways. So how do we develop talking about that self-awareness and um, one of the first points that I can suggest is starting with the career development course. This is our new online career development support for all our students that contains 18 units on various topics related to career development. And one of them is the self-awareness unit. And um, we've had some fantastic feedback from students who have completed the, the course and this particular unit. So um, when we leave here from today, um, have a look at the career development course and the self-awareness unit and start working through that unit yourself. Um, there are a lot of re learning resources there and exercises that will help you to realize um, how um, great you are and what you can offer to, to future employers. 
The next um, powerful way of developing that self-awareness is researching your career options and understanding what the employers are looking for in terms of um, requirements from their um, candidates so that you know how your um, qualities and skills match what the um, employers are looking out there for, for the graduates. And um, another way of developing that awareness and understanding of yourselves is, of course, work experience. And you heard how much through the various work experience Jido has developed herself and that awareness. So I think by far this is the greatest way of understanding what are you good at, what you can still improve, what is it that you makes you happy in that role and what um, the, the skills that you have developed so far. The additional resources such as the psychometric test, you might have heard of Myers-Briggs, for example, these are online, um, again, tests and tools that can help you analyze yourselves more deeply and um, provide you with a more better insight of your personality traits or um, characteristics, again, that you can communicate through to employers. And I mentioned that briefly earlier, talking to others that you really trust and that you really um, value their opinion. They've, they'll be very good to highlighting and pinpointing and uh, show, showing you how good you were at certain things that you may not have been aware of. So um, speak to those people and take, um, take their, their feedback as well. Okay, so what's next after your university, um, depending on your level of studies at the moment on your circumstances? There's some proven ways of helping our international students to improve their career prospects whilst they are here with us in Swansea. They've already mentioned some of them, but I want to, to give this uh, another snapshot of these. So stepping outside of the things that you're comfortable with, or even thinking, oh, I'm not good at sports. Well, maybe challenge yourself and think otherwise and say, I'm going to give um, you know, th this a go. I'm going to take up on running or I'm going to, um, to look into you know, if I can do tennis or, or other sports. So step out of what you, you're happy and comfortable and stretch yourself, put yourself out there. This will develop your, um, as well your English skills. You'll get in to communicate with others, you improve that. Um, and again, um, it will lead to improving the, the confidence as well. That in itself would give you probably the, the springboard to getting involved with additional um, extracurricular activities such as our fantastic um, societies and clubs that we have. I believe we have over 80, is that correct, Teresa? 80 societies, 90 at the moment? Georgia Rose, can you confirm? Yeah, 187 society. Oh, <laughs> that's, that's increased. That's fantastic. That's awesome. So there is a society for everybody, whatever your interest is and whatever um, your, your hobbies are. Have a look at these societies again and get involved with them. They do some amazing work. And look for work experience. It has been difficult and it has challenged many um, of our existing um, placement setups with employers, but many work experiences are going ahead remotely. So we have prepared um, a COVID-19 support page for our students on the Swansea Employability Academy website. So have a look there specifically for the, for the um, remote work experience section and start um, investigating those links so that you can do some work experience remotely. This is possible and many students have had um, work experience uh, from the comfort of their home. You could argue that at the moment as well, you could work for an employer anywhere in the world through the remote working. You could be working for a company based in Shanghai or um, in um, New Zealand or whatever else in the world. You don't have to be in Swansea, so you're not limited. So this has opened a whole range of opportunities. You just have to go out and, and search for them. Um, some of them will be advertised, but many won't be. That's why it leads me to the next point about networking. And again, it was mentioned earlier, the power of knowing the right people to communicate what you really want to share 
I'm looking for, for experience and exactly what experience, or I'm really keen to come and join you. I'm really impressed by the project that you're doing. Can I come and help and provide solutions to your team? So reach out to people, even those who you don't know. We have a, a great network in Swansea through LinkedIn and also through Swansea UniConnect. These are people out there who are um, prepared to help you to um, meet you virtually, to help with the CV, to offer you work experience. So they're there um, saying, I'm here to help. So reach out to them. And of course, take initiative and be curious, um, research further, be proactive. And if you can lead, there are many opportunities. Discovery is one of um, the ways on, um, on campus that offers various opportunities. So there are a number, a huge number of projects that they lead and you can take a leadership role within them. You could even become a trustee and again, build on that experience and exposure to knowledge, to contacts and to opportunities. Okay, so some more specifically, the, the range of experience that we offer. Employment Zone, if you haven't already visited the website, is the digital um, board for advertising all opportunities to our students. So take a look and sign for updates. So every time there's something new posted, you could be the first to find out and apply. Our fantastic Swans University Ambassador Scheme offers, offers our students the amazing opportunity to um, gain experience to earn money and of course to network and to to work with with people across the university and outside to be um, the face of our university if you like we also have the reaching wider which focuses on teaching on working with schools again these are paid opportunities that you can apply for and gain work experience which is fantastic on your cv and of course you you learn a lot from that Work experience doesn't necessarily have to be paid. There are a range of unpaid opportunities, again, through our employment zone. Some of them are within your um, academic departments. They are advertised, you get the chance to apply. Others you can self-source, as I mentioned earlier, if you research employers, if you look out for opportunities that you would be interested in doing and create these, we can support you through that. You can source and create your own opportunities as well. There are year-long placements in industries as well that are a, a great way of developing that self-awareness, gaining experience and enriching your CV. This could be part of your degree um, between your second or final year, um, could be organised by your college and school. So if that's an option, have a look at those and investigate that further. Again, a fantastic way to pave your, your way into the graduate level job because the majority of the... Um, companies recruit through their placement scheme for the graduate jobs. They use their placements and the in industry as a springboard um, to get into the, um, the, the, the graduates that they really want to employ. So volunteering, I mentioned discovery. Of course, there are other voluntary organizations um, around and on our website, we have links to those. So take a look and again, express your interest, reach out to them to find out how you can help them. At the moment, there's a lot to do with, um, for example, online learning. So your knowledge in maths or in um, economics or in business or in media, whatever your subject is, um, I'm sure there'll be something that you could help with and get involved and contribute as well as developing your skills. And we already had one fantastic case um, live you know, talking to us about um, the experience, but um, I here wanted to, to share another example. And you may remember Mayank, um, who is now a successful, launched a very successful um, law career. But Mayank was initially um, came from, from India to do his um, LM. Um, LLM course here with us in Swansea. And I remember meeting him and being really um, impressed by that positive attitude, um, by that um, um, 
keenness to be engaged, to get involved, to be curious, just to try and experience everything that the university can offer him. So he became a student ambassador. And also um, I remember him doing some student calling, being involved in one of our campaigns. We often get these. So keep an eye as well in your um, email boxes for these messages to say, hey, here's some part-time work for you. So um, make sure that you know you read these and you apply like he did. So he worked calling international students um, and again using the, the opportunity to, um, to, to communicate that way and being paid. He was a member of the National um, Well Swimming Pool and engaged in, in a number of, of, of sports as well. And um, this is what my Yang's um, kind of final advice was, because um, I wanted him to, to leave um, something as an advice for students. And this is what, um, what he said. First of all is um, number one for him was when he arrived to explore the facilities, to find out everything he could about what's, what's on offer. So if you haven't already done that, if you're a new international student, I know the opportunities, to do that have been limited, but again, through online or connecting with somebody, try to find out more about what's available, what the university can offer you, because there's tons, there's a lot of initiatives, a lot of projects going on. And then choose which ones is that you would like to be involved with. Um, he followed us in C. He was um, a regular in our office. Um, he communicated with us. He engaged with us. He helped us. We helped him back with advice and, and support. So it's that um, um, joint and um, um, kind of a two-way communication with, with our students that we have. Um, so yes, um, he just looked at everything possible there for, um, for him and engaged with that really well. He also said, if you're going to do a master's, um, focus on your academic studies, this is your priorities for now. So manage these alongside all these activities, but priority is on that academic success to get that grade that you would really aim to achieve. And um, yeah, subscribe to information sources, to reliable information sources, I must stress, because not everything out there is, um, is reliable, but um, particularly about funding and further education, we have those reliable sources on our website. So visit those. And of course, the one that Chido had listed in her slides as well. And um, that was at the time when we were in, in the library. Um, that's obviously not the case now, but again, um, the equivalent would be on social media. Keep an eye for all the, the different opportunities posted or messages that you get, get involved with so that you can add to your CV and of course, earn some money. Okay, <clears throat> moving on then to um, what are the options after graduation as, as international students and understand that um, for many of you it will be the um, very attractive to stay and to, to continue to get some experience in the UK and um, rather than thinking a job or postgraduate study um, I present you with these as options for you to consider all at the same time and try and uh, apply for all of them rather than thinking, oh, maybe a master's or a job. So for you to think and apply for all of these that interest you and see what comes first. So apply for a job and a master's or PhD and for graduate training scheme and for work experience, which is a shorter term, and maybe look into the opportunities about starting your, your own business. Kelly, I see is here to support you and to tell you more about that. So rather than thinking all oh, at the moment, open up wider your options and consider all of these, make a list and start doing something about them because you just don't know what's around the corner and what, um, what will this open up, what an opportunity will become your way. Okay, so um, if it is about a job um, that you, you're really looking for, my advice would be to start really early. I have spoken to a number of students who are coming towards the end of their visa and then contacting me for help. It's far too late 
for us to, to support you at that stage. So whatever your intentions are, again, share them with us so we can help you at this stage. But begin that process early and research your, um, your interest very, very early in advance so that you know how you can work and what you need to, to, um, to do well in advance before your visa runs out. So um, in, in that process, you can start again to promote your skills and attributes as an international student. You have so much to offer, so it's such a unique perspective and so much to bring to an organization. And you would know that by researching these organizations and finding out what are their values, what they stand for, and looking at how and what are the synergies between what you can offer and what they're looking for and building a list of those employers that interest you. It's never early enough to be aware of who are the employers that you like, what are they looking for, and how to apply for them so that you can prepare. And, um, you know, making sure that you start um, familiarizing with the application processes. Some companies um, have a very rigorous and a long process of applying through them through online assessment centers and um, interviews um, and a range of exercises. So make sure that you understand this so that you can prepare really well ahead of the deadlines. Others are very informal and just asking you to complete an application form or a CV. So is that knowledge ahead and early so that you don't miss any deadlines and that you're very well prepared? Okay, a little overview of really where the jobs are so that you have that understanding. It may be different from your countries and they know that from the international students that I work with. How things work in your country and how the job market works here um, is very different. So at the largest part at the bottom you'll see it's the internal moves, the internal opportunities and promotions. That's why having, uh, having done a placement within a, uh, an organization will help you tremendously. You are considered as an internal candidate. The company would know about the quality of your work, about the standards of your work, about what you're capable of, and will be much easier than to, to grow up with them, um, to, to, to build that career with them. Um, in addition to that is those networks and contacts that we talked about, so the people that you know it is very important to have those and to reach out or to, to develop them. You may think, okay, I have just arrived, I'm new to the university, I don't have these networks. We talked about different ways of how you can start making small steps and growing that network. Um, you have your um, college um, um, friends, you have your lecturers, you have your um, additional advisors and um, and the sub clubs and societies that you can reach out to think of who and what else um, you can you can connect with to increase those contacts. So then come the recruitment agencies. Um, many of them work um, very, very well. So um, check them out before you apply, before you submit your CV. Um, again, um, most of them are very reputable. Some of them specialize in certain sectors, for example, law or IT. So again, a knowledge of which recruitment agency you sent your CV here is important. And at the top, probably the last part, the smallest part of the jobs is what we see advertised for various reasons, as particularly lately, employers are cutting down on those expensive um, ad job adverts and they're taking things into their hands, being proactive, looking for candidates online, um, inviting speculative applications. So another reason why you need to network, to be on LinkedIn, to be out there communicating and reaching out to them so that they know that you're looking for opportunities and sometimes, well, very often nowadays, it's a common practice for you to be headhunted by an employer who would invite you to go through their recruitment process or even fast track you um, straight into the maybe assessment center um, ahead of other candidates only on the basis of your LinkedIn, for example. Okay. And then for those returning home, um, again, um, Tido mentioned the, the culture shock um, that she experienced. Um, you haven't been home for a while, and it's very likely that you'll experience the reverse culture shock. 
having been away from home, going back may feel strange. So keeping in touch with what is happening there and being up to date with the latest developments in the labor market is very important um, with things that are happening economically, politically, with your friends, um, with the contacts that you already have. So and start revising those connections, start sending emails and saying hello to people and again sharing your intentions um, saying I will be coming back home soon just to let you know update them, update them on how you're doing with your degree and on all the the knowledge that you've gained or in projects that you have done that link up well with what they're doing and don't forget to join our alumni um, association and um, again be part of that that Swansea link is very strong People who've been to Swansea University really support each other. And we are very tribal in, um, in ourselves, particularly at crisis like we're going through at the moment, the pandemic. And we tend to support each other and stick together. So again, that alumni collection, uh, the connection is very strong. So reach out to people who have completed your course, for example, and not long ago, they'll know what you're going through and they'll be very willing to help. And research, the earlier that you research opportunities back home, the better. And of course, preparing applications and sending out, um, sending those out to employers. OK, so if your plan is to return back home, make sure that, again, you start that process and prepare for that before you leave. Um, so, again, that you um, you're in a better um, position when you return back home. OK, so. Um, we're talking now, uh, I know we're going to have a session later on CV. I just wanted to make um, something um, here, uh, again, more, more explicit about how to make that international experience count, how to be very confident and um, to communicate that through all that you have learned, not just academically. You have learned a lot about being culturally aware, about working across um, teams and um, that open mindedness, um, your adaptability and all your independence. Being living in a, in, a, in a new country is such a huge experience and um, your character growth, the way you've grown as a person is one of the main things here. Um, alongside your resilience and resourcefulness that you need to communicate through, to articulate through in your CV and in your applications, alongside all the communications and your problem solving skills. But I'll talk to you more about CVs in the next session. So moving on then, I want to leave you with a final thought again from Mayank, um, who said, be an optimist, be positive, indulge in student activities with your peers, and maintain high spirits about the future. If you look for the opportunity, you're almost certainly going to find it. Try Verdi's ice cream and take walks on the beach. I would definitely encourage all of these. Okay, and this is how we can support you in the Academy. I mentioned our digital jobs board. If you haven't reached out to that, please go straight away and, and, and register. We also have a very newly developed graduate support program that can support you as graduates. So when you transition from students to graduates, we're still here for you. We have a huge range of website resources, reliable, that you can consult at any point in time, and the COVID-19 resources being the latest. We also have a um, series of webinars, careers, affairs and events. Employers are coming and they want to meet you. This is an excellent chance for you to network, so come along. These will be likely to be virtual for the time being. When they're live again, come and say hello, talk to them, network. Of course, we have a confidential and impartial careers guidance. Careers consultants are here to help you with all the queries that you have, answer all the questions, listen to you, most importantly. Whatever your question is, come and talk to us in confidence. And the career development course that I talked to you about earlier, that's on Canvas, and it's a great source initially 
to raise your awareness and to tune in, to start developing that know-how about how to navigate in the recruitment process in the UK and how to develop that knowledge and skills and the confidence to, to compete because it is competitive out there. And as Chido said, it was hard before, now it's even harder. In the summer, over 100 graduates applied for every graduate position. So things are um, obviously going to continue and be, be, be challenging out there, but you have what it takes. You have all the skills. All you need to do is to reach out for more help, to put yourself out there and you will get it there. Okay, any questions from you? Thank you very much, Jafka. I think I'll just leave questions until the end. So right. we hopefully would round up at um, 20 minutes past three, so you can come back and you know ask all, all the questions. Please note them down. Um, thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. Honestly, I have learned a lot and I've definitely learned a lot from you even before this anyway. And absolutely love a birdie's ice cream, even though I think Jules is better, but it's okay. <laughs> Always that, yes. I know. Yeah, so um, birdies. <laughs> Honestly, but anyway, we'll take a five minute comfort break now and come back at 10 past two. Sorry. Yeah, 10 past two um, for Kelly's session on entrepreneurship. So you could go grab a cup of tea, grab some ice cream, maybe if it's not too cold. Oh, can you allow me to share screen as well? So this is yes, yes. All good. Here we go. Can everyone see my screen okay? Thumbs up if you can. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you, Teresa. So hello, everyone. Good afternoon. As you know, my name is Kerry Jordan, and I am the Senior Entrepreneurship Officer here at Swansea University. And my job is to make students more entrepreneurial, okay? So I have my screen went through. So that's enterprise, okay? Enterprise, entrepreneurship, entrepreneurial, all mean the same thing. And that's to make you guys have these skills and this uh, behaviour and impact and knowledge to go into the workforce and be able to utilize them, apply them, okay? A lot of people think, well, enterprise, I don't wanna go and start my own business. It's so much more than that, guys, okay? These skills are the skills that are gonna make you stand out. So I always say to students, you go um, for an interview for a job, fantastic. So on usually on the um, job spec, they last for communication skills, team working skills, problem solving and a degree, fantastic. So these are what we call obviously employability skills. Everyone who's, if that's on the application form, everyone who's going for the interview has these already. So how are you gonna make yourself stand out? Can you, can you know, are you able to go and say, actually when I was in university, I was given a project, or I researched an idea, I looked and researched the market, what competitors are doing, how to take a product to market. I understood, you know, what the niche was, how to drive it, how to take the idea forward. And all of these things were enterprises, okay? It's allowing you to think like an entrepreneur for work in an organization so we call that entrepreneurship and we'll help you if you, in the future if you wanted to go and start a business as well we'll get to that a little bit later on so it's all about building these skills guys okay and this is what's going to give you competitive advantage when you are applying for jobs so how do we help you do this in the enterprise team we do interactive weekly workshops we actually run these across the whole of wales so you get to network and meet other students from other universities which i think it adds a lot of value we put on workshops to allow you to build new skills. We do mentoring with people in your industry. We provide funding. So last year we gave out about £30,000 um, direct cash to students from our team. But in general, across the whole university, £60,000 was given to students to start businesses. We have incubation space on Singleton campus, which sadly, as you can all imagine, isn't in use at the moment due to restrictions. We run a variety of competitions, which you can all get involved in, which I will go through with you um, just after this. We do entrepreneurship talks, which are amazing, guys, to hear what people are doing. Um, we've got some coming up now, which I'll talk to you about. These are people who started a businesses in the middle of COVID. They've actually seen this adversity and think, I'm going to go and start a business. 
we've all seen the news lines we've all seen you know what are they saying 18 years of economic growth is wiped out in just one year you know they're all saying about how the economy you know how the unemployment is rising there's less jobs for students we want to support you guys to go and be able to do that sorry i was echoing then <laughs> um so yeah and business advice talks anything along those lines so how can you get involved what can you do so yourselves we've actually run a voucher called just enterprise it where we allow students to go and run their own enterprise event because sometimes we realize you know we don't always know what a student wants you know we support students from the, their own events then so we can give 200 pound towards an event that can go towards catering it can go towards when you know face to face if you want the physical space it can go towards paying for a speaker and the only thing we ask is that it's an enterprise led event, whether you mention about startup businesses, whether you mention about the enterprise team or the support to become a more entrepreneurial, ending along those lines. But any student who wants to run an event is able to access this. So if you're in a society, I know Chido mentioned earlier she was in um, the Accounting and Finance Society. I know she mentioned she was in, I'm sure she said this is the Zimbabwe Society as well. Sorry, Chido, if I'm wrong, correct me. Um, but there's loads of different societies, you know, and we can all start working together to put on these enterprise events. Another thing I want to raise your attention to is the Centre for African Entrepreneurship. Has anyone heard of these before? They're based in Swansea. They're not part of the university, but they do support um, and do some fantastic things um, for African entrepreneurship. So we have a good relationship with them here at the university. So that would be something to look at. OK, so I have mentioned a bit now what enterprise is and what we do. Um, and I've been asked to put on a pitching workshop. So my department is renowned for our pitching workshops, okay? Um, I've only got a short space of time, so I am actually gonna squeeze it in to this session. So a pitch, guys, okay? There's so many different times when you pitch. You pitch when you go for a job interview. You know, you may say, can you do a 10 minute presentation? That is a pitch. You are pitching your knowledge, your skills, why they should pick you for the job during that presentation. You might not be saying those words, but you're doing it through your knowledge of the topic and your experience, okay? When you, um, when you meet someone for the first time at a networking event, you may have one minute to pitch who you are, you know, why you're there, what you're doing, what you hope to get from it, etc. You know, you may, like, they call it a, the elevator pitch sometimes, which is a minute, because you might be stuck in an elevator with someone and you may have to get all this information across as fast as you can uh, to them. So I think it's really important sometimes that you learn how to construct a pitch. I've watched, oh gosh, I would say hundreds of pitches this year so every year I think I probably watch about a thousand students pitch altogether whether that's in groups or on their own I've read countless of magazines I've been to countless of training sessions of how to deliver the perfect pitch so we've worked with NatWest to construct the five points how to structure a pitch guys and you can use this for anything you are doing so how to structure the pitch okay First of all, when you're doing it, you want to hook, guys. You want to hook someone in to grab their attention, okay? Everyone always starts their presentation with, hello, I am Kelly, and I am here today to tell you about blah, blah, blah. Think now, we watch hundreds of them, and it gets a bit like, oh. And sometimes I get to the end of the pitch, and the pitch wasn't good, and I can't even remember the name then, because I'm like, I just lost interest, you know? So that happens a lot. So I always say to people, don't start like that. Don't start in a traditional way. Start with like a rhetorical question. Get them thinking or engage them in, hook them in. Okay. If I was start to you and said, did you know that tier four students or any international students aren't actually allowed to start a business? You'd all be like, well, why aren't we allowed to start? Why, what, what's going on here? What are you going to talk about now? Okay. And it's really important to hook. So, you know, find what they're interested in, why are they here, and hook them with that. Or if you're going to pitch an idea, so say you now you come up with um, a new brand of coffee, okay? And what, what makes your coffee different than everyone else's? How are you going to get it? Or is your hook going to be asking people, how many cups of coffee do you drink a day? It gets them engaged. It gets them thinking, oh, God, how many cups of coffee do I drink a day? Do I admit how much I drink a day? <laughs> do I not admit how much I drink? You know, it's that sort of thing. You get them thinking. So you're hooking them and grabbing their attention from the word go. OK, and you will stand out then for that. Then also to people, the problem. And they go, well, if I'm doing an interview, it's not a problem. There's always a problem. And that's why you're there to solve the problem. So my problem, um, if I'm presenting to you guys today, is a lot of you don't know about the enterprise team or why we're here. And that, that's the problem. And what I say to people is know your problem and love it because your problem is what's giving you your solution. OK, so if you are going to interview for um, 
well, I know at the moment, Theresa, correct me if I'm wrong, but the officer roles will be coming up for election shortly and there'll be new campaigns out. So you know, if you were going to do a campaign in a pitch, for example, to be the next um, full time or part time officers, you know, knowing the problems, what problems the students face in the university and, you know, what's your solution? How are you going to overcome them? OK, there's always a problem. You just got to find that problem that's linked to business. So for me, in the enterprise team, it's like I said, students don't know I'm here and that's a problem. OK, so how many students engage in enterprise activity? Only 4,000. We've got 25,000 students. So I'm not even engaging with a quarter of students at the university. And that's a problem. OK, so know the problem and love it. Know it inside out. Your solution, guys. This is the third part. This is your time to shine. OK, what have you come up with? So what's your idea? What's your unique selling point? How will it work? What's the magic underlying it? Is there anyone else doing this at the moment? If so, how are you different? How are you going to stand out? How are you going to get to market? How are you going to get the customers to know who you are? Why, you know, why should we look at to support you? So this is important, all your solution, okay? And that's what you've come up with. So, you know, give as much information for that as you can, but not too much that you bore people. Okay, don't use technical jargon, just give the key points. So what your solution is, how you come up with it, how it's going to work, what's the market size, is there demand, what makes you unique and what makes you different. Okay, then I want you to look at your team interaction. So who's in your team? If it's you, what knowledge do you bring? What skills do you bring? It's really important, guys, okay? And when are you going to start, you know, making a return, making a profit if you go, you go in for... Um, uh, money, if you're asking for money, or you know, maybe you're asking for other things, okay? So at the end, we always say and ask. I see so many presentations, and we get to the end, and people don't ask for anything. That's great if you've been asked to present for um, as part of your module, but if you're doing if it's real life and you meet someone and you do pitch about yourself and nothing at the end, that's great. You've told them about yourself, but there's no action. You know, ask them or make a link with you on LinkedIn. Don't forget to put an ask in. You know, if there's an investor there asking for money, if you pitch to me now, what could you ask for? Ah, oh, Kelly, can we have um, contacts? Can we have mentoring? Can we have support? You know, these are all massive things, especially when you've got an idea to think about taking it forward. And when you ask for something, don't forget to tell them the reward. OK, so if you're asking for money of someone, are they likely to get their money back? If so, when are they likely to get it back? You know, are you asking for contacts? You know, are they able to link you up with someone? How would it help you? You know, how would it help them? So think about all them things, okay, guys? So when you're pitching, no matter if it's trying to chat someone up at a bar on a night out, <laughs> or whether it is pitching an idea or a presentation for an interview, that structure normally works for everything, okay? So if you're going for a job interview, the ask could be, you know, from my presentation today, I would ask for that I be considered for the role because, you know, and that could be the end conclusion of your um, presentation. For a lot of people then, okay, they get the structure right, which is great. However, sometimes they get the slides all wrong, okay? So a lot of people, when I've seen, they have done it by death by PowerPoint. I'll be honest, my slide isn't the most prettiest slide I've ever seen for a pitch, um, and I'll be honest with that. As you can see, I've tried to put quite a lot of information on there at key points, but I've tried to not put every single word I'm saying on the slide, okay? And that's really important as well. The slide's just there to guide you and the audience through the presentation. It's not there for you to read off. And it's not there for the audience to read off, okay? They don't want to read every single word because otherwise they're not listening to what you were saying. So that's one mistake. The second mistake people make is talking like this and they think they can talk like this the whole way through the presentation. And I've seen that so many times. It's quite interesting actually, guys. Only 7% of what you do or say in a presentation is actually taken in by the audience. I'm talking to you for half an hour now and I wonder how much stuff I say you're actually going to take away. So if it's, that leaves us in 93% open. So how else? So 38 is with my tone of voice. I don't know if you notice, but I try and change my tone of voice. I emphasize key parts. You know, I try and make it engaging. I try and bring a bit of humor in, you know, just to make it all fit to make it more memorable. And then 55% is through body language. A lot of people say, well, actually, we're presenting and via Zoom, so body language isn't important. Guys, it's more important than ever at the moment, okay, to show that you can engage via Zoom. So, you know, good eye contact. So I'm trying to look at the screen as much as I can, even though my presentation's over here somewhere, and uh, to try and engage with you, which I think is really important. Using your hands, you know, and body language is obviously your facial expression as well. It's eye contact. 
you know it's just putting yourself to sit upright you know to show you're engaged to show you're passionate and that can be done um you don't have to be standing up in front of someone to do that that can be done via zoom okay so that's really important 55 percent is through body language i don't know how many times i've watched the presentation and there's been someone fidgeting in front of me and i've been so caught up they, you know it wasn't very engaging what they were saying and i just ended up watching the person fidgeting because <laughs> that was more interesting which is quite bad you know so always bear in mind when you're presenting face to face as well where you put your hands how you're standing the amount of people i see who sway like this in a presentation and they don't realize this way in it's quite funny um you know but all of these things do happen so let me see my time i'm okay for time at the moment so you may have heard me mention when I was giving an example of my pitch that students who are international, so if you're on a tier four visa, that's any student who isn't um, from the UK or the EU, um, fingers, we don't know how that's going to end up with the EU at the moment, but you should be obviously if you're here studying probably on either a student or what we call a tier four visa. Okay, so what that means is you are limited. As you know, you can study, you're here to study, and you, you can work up to 20 hours in term time. And in non term time, you are able to work more hours. Okay. What you cannot do, which a lot of people do not know, you can't claim any public funds such as benefits. You can't work in certain jobs, like you can't be a sports coach or a professional sports person. And what a lot of people really don't know is you're actually not allowed to start a business or be self employed or register as a director of the company here in the UK whilst you are studying on one of these visas. Okay. That isn't anything to do with the university. That's a rule made by the Home Office, and that applies to anyone who is an international student studying here in the UK. Okay. Worst case scenario, if you do set up a business, you do get found out. You will get reported to the Home Office. Okay, and they will do they, the Home Office do do checks to check the via company's house and check on the students. The worst case, you could end up having your visa taken off you, which probably means you could get deported from the UK. Okay. So when I say to students, you know, you can't start a business. Well, you can, you can. Guys, it's not worth it to wait one or two years. You know, it's really not worth risking it now. So that's my biggest advice to you. And the main thing I want to take you to take away today. However, that does not mean we can't work together and start a plan. If you have a business idea, we can work with you guys. OK, we can get all the plans in place. So when you're graduated, whether you want to stay here in the UK or whether you want to go back um, to your home to start a business, completely up to you. But we can help, you know, support you to get you started then. What we can do, uh, we can get your plans in place. You know, we can go through your idea. We can go through a business plan with you. We can go through, you know, how you're going to reach your customers at the time, what you actually need to set this business up. OK, and these are all things we can work with you on up until then. But like I said, you cannot start the business whilst you're on this visa. So you heard me mention that if you wanted to stay here um, to start the business after, there are visas you can apply for. One is called a startup visa, and that's looking for people to establish a business here in the UK for the first time. So what we say is that we do like the ideas to be different, so innovative, valuable, so it means they will last, and scalable, which means they can obviously um, be scaled then uh, to make more profit, okay? So that's the start of visa. Swansea University will be an endorser at present because of, as you can imagine, all the changes and everything going on in the world, especially with um, COVID. Everything is on hold at the moment. Sadly, our start of visa is on hold. We are hoping to have that um, reinstated. Well, I can't give you a time frame because no one knows really what's going on at the moment. But fingers crossed it will be in this year. Fingers crossed. What you can apply for. Um, which we don't actually endorse, but it can be endorsed as an innovation visa. This is if your business idea is completely different and it's never been seen before here in the UK. We they will grant them visas then, but you need to be what we call approved and endorsed by a body. OK, so they're just two things you want to think about. So if you're sitting there thinking, oh, jeepers, I had a really good business idea, you know, that's great. We can still, like I said, work on planning it now. And then when you go to graduate, you can think, OK, I really want to stay in the UK to run this business I come up with. Or it might be the case of actually, do you know what? I know the market back home better than I know it here in the UK. Maybe that's Australia. Maybe it's China. Maybe it's India. Maybe it's Africa, United States, South America, wherever. And you might decide, well, actually, I'm going to go back home to run my business because when you're running a business, support, guys, is so important. And I don't just mean support by people like myself for support from your family, from your friends, okay? That is really important as well. So 
I've talked a little bit about like the enterprise team and what we do. So like I hope you realize now the enterprise team isn't just here to help you start a business. We're here to help you develop skills, but we can support you to start a business as well. And like I said, we will help you hold your hand through the process. And when it is legal for you to start and, you know, in terms of your visa, we will help you start. So what have we got going on, then you can engage with in the meantime. So every Tuesday night, like I said, we do workshops called Explore. That's with other universities and college across Wales, where we have entrepreneurs to come in and we work through 15 different skills. Um, so every week is a different skill to get you guys to upskill yourself in these areas. This will be about all about, you know, creativity and um, being adaptable, um, motivating staff, motivating yourself. OK, and there's 15 what we call different competencies that we cover. Wednesday, the 17th, 24th of Feb and the 3rd of March, we are actually having startup stories with Swans University alumni. So these are, well, there's one current student and two alumni who've gone off and done fantastic things during the time of COVID, okay? Even though it's been adversity, they thought, I'm still going to go and start a business, and they have. And they'll be coming back to us and talking about what it was like. So, you know, what it was like to, how they got followers, how they set up their social media pages. They are the biggest piece of advice to you guys looking to, you know, go down that path as well, which would be really good. On Wednesday the 10th then, it's International Women's Day. Um, it's not actually the 10th, it's that week, but we are celebrating it and Enterprise on the 10th. And we have three fantastic alumni who are now running successful million pound businesses come back and tell us all about their journeys, okay? One of them graduated in 2018, someone else graduated in 2016. Um, so people who haven't graduated that long ago, you know, who've already gone off and taken the industries by storm. So please, you know, come along to that. That would be a fantastic event. So on March 17th, there'll be a pitching perfect um, sort of seminar, similar to what I've just done with you now, but a lot more um, in detail and also people pitching back to me and we'll be able then to go through them pitches. On the 24th of March, we have what we call the big pitch competition. This is like my favorite competition of the year. Students are able to come and pitch for three minutes how entrepreneurial you are. This might be for a work placement. It may be for funding to go and start a business. And maybe for mentorship, but we help you whatever you need to get started. OK, so that is on the 24th. And then in every June, we run an accelerator program, which is a five day program. You come in a Monday with a vague idea and we help you plan. And then on the Friday, you should have a business plan ready. And when you're able to, to go and start trading. OK, but like I said, don't forget, if you are on a tier four visa or student visa, you're not able to start up at the moment, but we can plan. And then you can decide if you want to stay in the UK, we can help you apply for a startup visa. Or if you want to go home, we can still help you and support you when you run your business back home. OK, what well, we guys, we all now have adjusted to technology. You know, there's no reason why when you leave here, if you don't stay in the UK, we can't support you because we can. You know, there's Zoom. We can have Zoom chats. That's what I've been doing for the last year now. <laughs> I'm having one to one Zooms to get students started. So, you know, when you graduate, don't feel like, oh, I've left the university now. I can't be involved. We support, uh, me personally, I support a graduate no matter how long ago they graduated from the university. If anyone needs our support, we are always here to help and support, okay? So don't ever feel like you're on your own. Please always reach back out to us. So you're probably thinking, well, how many people have actually started businesses? In 2020, we had 50, five zero students start businesses. That's either just after graduation or whilst they're studying. Some examples I pulled together be here for you. So there was a few from the School of Management, from Computer Science, we have them from Human and Health Science, Medicine, everywhere. But just a few I thought I would um, raise your awareness to. So we have Joe, who was a business student who was in, obsessed with technology and flying, and he set up his own um, technology business, and he's now selling to aircraft schools to train pilots amazing you know he had no technical um training he was just passionate about tech and coding and he studied business kanisha i don't know if anyone here has ever met kanisha i hope so she only graduated um in july just gone she actually set up a platform when she was here called phoenix descriptions that was actually helping um local charities so she found that only six percent guys such small money we give to charity actually goes towards that charity itself the rest of it does tend to go towards marketing or wages etc and that hardly any money went to local charities you know we all sponsor the big ones but actually not so much the local charities so Kanisha set up phoenix subscriptions and for as small as a cup of coffee you could sponsor three of the local charities so one was um 
one for children with disabilities to go and serve. Uh, the other was Matthew's House, which was um, a homeless shelter. And I can't remember the third, which she'll probably shout to me for in the future. Um, but yeah, so you know, she did some fantastic things when she was here. I do many of you follow Kanisha after she graduated into a pandemic. She actually set up her own YouTube channel, talking through students through what it was actually like. You know, she opened her um, results live on her channel. Um, she went on the after interviews and, you know, she spoke when she was deflated or, you know, maybe not getting the results she went in really powerful stuff guys really honest and down to earth which is amazing so if you are struggling a little bit please go and check that out it is really good and she's such a lovely warm person another one we had there was easily eco they were again annoyed with the wastage of plastic and they wanted to make um students more plastic free so they actually came up with hampers start a hampers for students to become more plastic free whilst they're in university and uh, they entered our 100 pound challenge uh, where we give them 100 pound they went off and bought loads of stock sold it and then give us a hundred pound back. So they got to keep all the profit and that got them started in their business. Um, and they've gone on to great things since then. They've had money to set up a website off us. Um, what else have they done? They had um, test traded on campus, variety of different things. And then the last one is a gentleman called David Sims. He studies computer science. Uh, David actually set up what we call 3D Crowd. So when the pandemic hit and we couldn't get enough PPE, I know, I know probably everyone's seen it on the news, um, which is very sad. He actually owned two 3D printers, so he started fundraising and getting money. He actually fundraised, I think it was nearly £20,000 in days to start um, buying material so he could print PPE. And he was donating it then to local charities like, you know, um, any care homes in Swansea, um, Swansea Bay NHS, etc, etc. Okay. So if you are interested, guys, in anything I spoke about today, please, please, please follow us on Facebook which is Swans University Enterprise. I will do a special offer today. Um, I will pick someone today from this chat and I will give you a £10 Amazon voucher and I will be checking you have been in this call as well. If you go and like our Facebook page, start like liking, sharing, commenting on our posts, I will pick one of them and I will give you a £10 Amazon voucher. Because we need obviously you guys to work with us. We're here to support you, but unless you guys help us come to us, we can't support, okay? We also have um, an Instagram, which we changed the name and a Twitter now to well, enterprise underscore swan. Um, we don't, we're not actually giving away swan, sorry, it's just Swansea. Um, and we do have an email address, which is enterprise at swansea.ac.uk. So if you are interested in the 200 pound voucher to put on an enterprise event, please let us know. If you wanted to start planning um, to, put a, to start up you know, a business after you graduate, come and see us. Or if you'd like to get involved in any of the competitions, any of the workshops I've mentioned, please get in touch with us. And my last slide, you will see these are just reviews we've had from our Facebook page. So not you think it's just us saying this. We've had some people who've said that, um, you know, it's enthusiastic and they say that everyone's getting involved in the enterprise team um, that, you know, really helped them, not just um, when they were in university, but after and also helped them to get a job. Someone actually said, you know, we are the, the diamond or the gem of the university, which is quite nice. But all of these reviews are on the Facebook page for you to read, guys, OK? I know um, Theresa said we were leaving questions until the end, so I'll stop sharing my screen now. So um, I know we'll be passing on to the next person. Thank you very much, Kelly. That was very, very insightful. Um, and please get on the competition so you can get your Amazon vouchers. Amazing. I will what be checking. <laughs> Definitely. Maybe I could get one, Kelly. No? Sort you out. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. So we'll go on now to Zdravka, who would take us through a cover letter workshop. Go on, Zdravka. Oh, I think you're mute, Jeffka, sorry. Yeah. OK. Um, how are we doing with the time? Because I wanted to start to kick off with a Kahoot quiz. Um, just tell me how we're doing with the time. Yeah, we're good. We're, we're good? good? OK, let me just... Um, just prepare that so we can... We can start a little bit... A, a bit um, fun, not uh, just the slides. 
Bear with me for a moment so we can get your phones ready and I'll give you the login for the game. So you'd need a second device for this? You would need a second device or to minimize um, your uh, window and kind of, um, you know, you can, you can use the, the existing laptop um, on a smaller, smaller one. So let me have a look. Are you giving us prizes? <laughs> I will give you a free CV check with myself. Oh, okay. If you I'm don't... only joking. All of you have a free CV check. So you don't have to pay. <laughs> okay. Oh, well, you could have, um, yeah, a, a point with, with, with myself, another careers consultant uh, at any time. Of course, bear with me. I'm just struggling to, um, to access myself from my end here, my game. Bear with me. <clears throat> Just a bit of housekeeping. So we are still recording and um, the recording will be on the Church Union's website um, by next week. And just also note, tomorrow's event is will be a complete different one. So it's not a repeat. It will be, you know, a lot more encompassing. So there will be um, talks on opportunities within within the Church Union as well as um, immigration policy advice as well. So please come to that one as well. Are you ready now, Shrefka? Yes, I am. And I can give you the pin number game. Um, the, the pin number for the game, it's 509-4015. I'll share my screen so you can see it as well. So that's on the kahoot.it. And the pin game is 509-4015. We already have two contestants, so no pressure. <laughs> Let's see. Thought we'll be a lot more competitive here. I can't say a lot of names yet. We'll wait. Gets really excited towards the end where the leaderboard changes and the you know the <laughs> the top three people start swapping places. So let's see how we're all gonna do. We'll wait a little bit more for everybody to get a chance to log in or to figure out how to do it on the laptops. You might post in the link on the chat if that's okay Just the link to the game yes please if not i could just yeah thank you um that's the link to my That's the link to the game. And then you'd need to enter the code that you see here on the screen, which is 509-4015. Okay, is everybody okay with the link? Should we wait a couple of more minutes? Or are you ready to go? I think we should. Okay. We should be ready to go. Okay, great. Let's make a start. So writing an effective CV. 
let's have a look at the first question. How long should a CV roughly be? So we're talking about the graduate level CV. How long should it be? Okay, well done. The graduate level CV in the UK is two pages long. And there's only one exception to this. It's um, for the academic CV, which is three to five pages. So um, bear this in mind. So not one page, not one and a half with the white, um, lots of whites left at the end, but two full pages of, um, of your CV. Okay, great. Next question. Is it okay to lie on your CV? You may be thinking, what a question, Stravka. You'll be surprised how many times I've been asked this question at, um, at sessions. So no, there are many ways to, the employers will find out whether you've been truthful or not. The employee agencies to verify the information you provide them with. So it is not acceptable and only tell the, the truth and the things that you have accomplished so far on your CV. Moving on then to the question number three, and that's what should be written at the very top of your CV? The first thing on page one, what should be, should that be? Yes, exactly, it's your name. Um, so there's no need for curriculum vitae and there's no need for anything else to begin with, just your name in the center with a, in a larger font. Well done, moving on to question number four. What should you always include with your CV? Well done, the answer is a cover letter. So it is the etiquette to accompany your CV with a cover letter, unless specified otherwise by the company. So if the company are looking just for a CV, they will um, say so. If not, always uh, write a, a cover letter to explain why you're applying for this position and to make it a bit more personal. I'll give you more details. We'll talk about this in a moment. Well done. So far, let's look. Who is in the lead? Well done. Moving on to question number five. Printing your CV on bright pink paper will help you to stand out or using bright pink pa paper generally. Is that true or false? Okay, um, there's no need for any color, for any graphics or any, any fancy fonts, unless you are applying for a designer position, a graphic design or anything that you need to demonstrate your creative skills on paper. There's no need for otherwise for that. So very simple font, plain white background on your CV, unnecessary tables um, or, or graphics would only prevent your CV from being screened. So if the company are using artificial intelligence to screen CVs, all these will make it um, uh, difficult for the software to detect the keywords and to shortlist you. So just very plain font and plain background. Okay, moving on to the next question. What order should your work experience be put in? Okay, so the CV would list all your experiences in a reverse chronological order, starting with the latest one. So what you have done most recently and then working your way back. Great. Next question. Is it necessary to name references on your CV? 
Pardon me, it isn't necessary to name them, but you should. Okay, the correct answer is there's no need to write their names and contact details on your CV. However, contact the people in advance and ask them if they're happy to provide with a reference. So when the company asks you um, for those details, you're available to give it to them. And of course, they will anticipate, they'll be prepared to give a reference for you. Great, so far, some wonderful winners here. The next question, generally speaking, how much time were the employers spent initially reading your CV? This surprised me as well. The correct answer is seconds. So the employers will just skim through your CV um, very briefly in seconds and if they they, they, they like what they see, they will go and read in more detail later on. But initially, they only like to, to take a very um, brief look. That's why it's important to have the information easily available to them so they can allocate, they can find out all the um, information that they're looking for that's relevant to them. Okay, great results, well done. Question number nine. You should give the complete name, address, and postcode of your school, university, and employers. True or false? The answer is false. There's no need for these details on your CV. So, the address of your school or the address of your university or your previous employers is not necessary, do not include that. Uh, all they, they need to see is your start, end date and the name of the employer and your position or the name of your school or the name of your university. Great, and the final question. What is the aim of your CV? Okay, ultimately, with your CV, you're trying to showcase to let the employer know how you meet their requirements. So they would have specified the criteria, essential requirements, and listed that. So with your CV, you are answering to those and giving evidence of how you meet these requirements. Okay, well done, everybody. Let's see the winners of today's quiz. I hope you enjoyed that. And Big round of applause to T, well done. Also, Chris and Olga, well, in fact, all of you, you've done really well. And um, I hope you enjoyed it as well. So a bit of a fun way, um, ins and outs, some questions, typical questions about CVs that I often get. So um, that was a, a nice way to get into the topic as well, because it's such a such a broad, such a big, and we don't have the time to cover everything today. Okay, let's continue then with um, the next thing on my slide. So, I mentioned briefly, I touched on this briefly, the purpose of the CV is to show the employees that you meet their requirements and that um, on the basis of this, they will shortlist you for an interview. So that's the purpose of the CV initially. Okay, so that's why you have to think very carefully about the three main things on your CV, the skills, knowledge and the experience and the personal attributes that the employee is looking for in their job description and to show examples and evidence on your CV of how you meet these. It is tricky on two pages. Um, that's where, you know, the experience and that's where the knowledge um, comes. So that's why we're here today to talk about how to do that, how to meet that challenge. So um, when CVs are used typically, um, at careers fairs and recruitment events, you take it to um, to the representatives there or to discuss, or if they ask, do you have a copy of your CV, you send it to them or you give a, um, a printed version. 
also during the application process. So in addition to um, an application form, employers may ask to attach CV. That's when the CV is, is used as well. You can use the CV to, to write to employers who are not necessarily advertising a job, but you have researched them, you have found them, and you're really keen to work for them. So you would send them your CV and the cover letter to ask for any opportunities there or to offer any help. Recruitment agencies, as we spoke earlier as well, would be um, recommending you and passing your details through the CV. So they'll ask for a copy of your latest and relevant CV. So you need to have that ready and provide the recruitment agency with that. And um, as I mentioned earlier, as a sub, as um, to accompany any other forms of applications for jobs. So the main types of CVs are the chronological CV and the skill-based CV. In addition to that, this academic CV if you're applying for roles in academia. At this stage, for most students, the chronological CV seems to be the most popular and the most effective type of CV. So unless you are looking to change careers or um, unless your degree is not particularly relevant to the industry you're applying to, then you'll be using the skill-based. Otherwise, stick to the chronological CV, which lists your education and experience in a reverse chronological order. And this is how the two main popular types um, differ. So um, the chronological CV, um, as I said, lists your accomplishments, your education, your experience, your achievements in a reverse chronological order. And the skill-based CV mentions on the first page the relevant skills and then followed by a paragraph about how you have developed these. So they're different in the format, um, but again, ultimately the aim for both of them is to get you through an interview. So the typical elements of a chronological CV are starting with your name at the top and then your contact details, followed by a personal profile. This is um, optional. With some industries, this is considered not, not necessary, for example, in law, um, that personal profile or objective you could, it could, could be left out. So then another section that um, it's forms part of your CV is the education and your qualifications, starting with your university degree, your currently, your course. The next section would be work experience followed by your achievements and interests. And finally, um, we, I'll, I'll talk about this in a moment, about the references. This could be left out. Okay, so um, the layout of your CV. Um, we talked about the, the structure and the different sections. How you go about this is entirely up to you. You can switch sometimes, um, you know, um, your sections, you could include additional ones such as um, responsibilities or voluntary work. That's, um, that's obviously um, part of creating that CV that's unique, that's bespoke, that's um, about you. And also um, you are tailoring that to the job that you're applying for. So every time you apply for a job, you'd need to tweak, you need to change the CV, the, sometimes the contents, or if you're talking about um, specific modules or skills, you'd need to make it relevant to every job and to every company you're applying to. So by reading the job specification and the description, this will give you an idea and very clearly you would know what the employers are looking for and then what to focus on your CV, what to include, what is relevant to them. So that will be your guide, the job description and the job specification. So that personal profile that we um, talked that it's the beginning of your CV, here are some ideas of how to go about writing this one. It's often tricky for students. So um, what to write in that short paragraph is about yourself, what you can offer, what are the skills, what is the knowledge that you have that is relevant to the job. And um, optionally, what is what you're aiming for? What is your long term career aim? Um, ultimately, is it to, to develop a career in um, finance or in banking? Is it to um, to uh, obtain further experience or placement or internship. Um, so what is it that you're aiming for um, 
career-wise. It has to be short and to the point. So in a couple of sentences to summarize yourself. And that's where the difficulties become when you have to put that in such a small amount of words. Um, one thing to consider here and to bear in mind is if you start in the first person to continue that profile in the same format um, rather than the third person, not to switch. For example, I am a final year um, media student with these and these skills. So um, if you start with I, use the I throughout the, the statement. If you use the third person, continue with that um, and not to mix those. And this is an example of a personal statement for the CV. So a couple of sentences in a very succinct way to summarize, to demonstrate how you meet the, the employer's requirements. And of course, in a very positive, dynamic and original way. If you think of them reading through hundreds of CVs, you'd need to grab their attention from the beginning with that opening profile, with something that um, shows you and describes the best qualities and the, the relevant skills. So this is an example about an educational um, graduate. So a dedicated and professional education graduate with strong communication skills, now seeking a teaching assistant role. Um, I have learning, teaching and child development knowledge combined with, oops, pardon me, I'm just trying to switch my, my screen. I'm not able to do that. Okay, so this um, this is the kind of professional profile and summary that you could include at the beginning of your CV before you're starting with your education. So think about how you can summarize yourself. And then that links to the, my previous presentation when I talked about your self-awareness. So you need to be aware of what you can offer to employers to be able to write this paragraph well. Okay, so we're moving then from that personal objective onto your education and qualifications. This is an example, a very powerful ways to use bullet points and the action verbs, verbs such as developed, organized, initiated, researched. So that's how it giving all the information to the employer in a proactive way, demonstrating your input, demonstrating your impact as opposed to the activities that you have carried out. So be mindful and again, think of how in a compact way you can communicate that through. Think of what you have done, what your achievements were, what you gained during your degree, any specific and relevant projects, any um, assignments or any research, what a particular um, module has given you in terms of knowledge and include that. So you have to be selective here. You can't include all your, um, your modules. You have to select those that highlight how you've gained that knowledge that the employer will benefit from. And you can see here a range of skills. So it's very important to focus on skills um, that you have gained from your degree. Okay, after the educational section is your work experience section you could list part-time jobs, relevant or not so relevant experience. And again, use the bullet points as a way of describing what you have achieved. So um, starting again with action verbs and linking that to the skills that you have developed. If you have relevant experience, for example, your law graduate applying or looking for uh, um, law related opportunities, and your law experience is maybe from um, before your, your degree or during your degree, and in the meantime, you have had other work experience, you can break the rule of the reverse chronological order and lift the relevant experience further up. So, and call that relevant work experience section so that it stands out and it's easy for the employer to find um, about your experience that is relevant to their industry. Okay, I spoke about the power verbs, the action verbs. These are some examples. So using ver uh, verbs such as guided, proven, um, eliminated, improved are uh, found to be very valuable and um, have a huge impact. So um, 
be mindful and use those on the CV with the bullet points. Okay, references. Um, these typically, and the latest on CV is that they're not required on the CV. However, if you apply for an in industry and um, you're an um, engineering student or computer science student, this would be different because the employers who are looking for e industry students would like to see references. So some exceptions to the, to the general rule. Um, check again with the employers, but the main, the latest on uh, references is that you can leave them out. So you don't have to put references on your CV unless you're applying for a year in industry within engineering and computer science. Okay, a little checklist from um, all the things that we talked about, about the CV and just to, to summarize really what the CV, successful CV would be. So it has to be professional all the, the spelling and the grammar should be correct. And it should be about you. It should be a reflection of your skills and your personality. That's why it's important that it's written by you because it's your style of writing and the, the way you, um, you communicate comes through in that CV. So the document has to be yours, written by you. That's the best way again, to create that impression of yourself. You can, of course, ask somebody to proofread that. There's no problem for them to check for any um, deliberate mistakes. But altogether, you should be the creators and the writers of that CV. And it has to be consistent. Um, it has to include all your achievements and highlighting those responsibilities um, as a way of you standing out and demonstrating um, all your best qualities to the future employers. We talked about the two-page rule. So um, recently I've, I've been speaking to many students and graduates and they say, oh, but I have a one-page CV, is it okay? I mean, sometimes employers may say, we just want you a one-page CV. That could be an exception, but I'm here, I'm talking about the general rule about graduate CVs, which is two pages. And I've circled relevant because it is very important and just to highlight um, the generic CV may not give you the result that you, you would hope such as an interview because it doesn't have the specific um, skills that the employer is looking for. That's why I'm highlighting and emphasizing how important it is to tailor the CV. So for every job that you're applying to, they may appear similar or even the same. There must be something different about the employer. One of them could be a large employer, the other one smaller. So try to tune in and to find out and to make that CV bespoke to that role and to that employer. And make it easy to, to read. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, if it's scanned through, if it is um, used um, uh, by artificial intelligence to shortlist you, so remove all the barriers. So very plain text, no tables, no unnecessary graphics. And of course, make it dynamic and positive. This is about you showcasing your very best and influencing those employers to invite you for an interview. And um, look at how you can stand out, how you can make it different, how, what is your unique selling point when you're writing your CV? What is different about you and how you can make that uh, clear on your CV? That will make the CV great and here if you let me i want to post something that is a research based on research from other universities um, it's called the cv rubric that's how you know you can do a little check of your cv at the moment and find out how good your cv is so um, colleagues from q university have compiled the research and this is what um, the employers are saying what is a good cv what on the CV will get you to the shortlisted pile and vice versa, what not to include so much on the CV. So take a look at the chat where I have just posted that and save that file for, for future references. I hope that is useful to all of you. Okay, so we're moving then to the cover letter and what the cover letter is, it is a way of making that succinct CV. As we said, it has to be compact, it has to be succinct, it's more factual. But of course, it cannot allow you, it does not allow you 
to make it personal. So that's the purpose of the cover letter, to inject a bit of personality there, to use more powerful words, more colorful words, again, to influence that employer. Particularly in, in the section that here I have highlighted in yellow about why this company and why this employer. What is it about them? What is so unique that interests you? Maybe you met them at a career fair, maybe you attended their workshop, maybe you um, had a placement with them um, in the past. What is it about them that really make you interested in joining them and working for them? So that's the opportunity, again, to tailor that, to make it unique and to make your application stand out. Think of those words that will have that impact, the words that describe you, the words that um, uh, create that impression of you and give the best, um, the best portrait of you possible. This, the cover letter is um, four paragraphs, about four paragraphs. The first one is about opening, um, explaining who you are and what you're applying for with the CV. And the second one, um, is more about your interest in that role or that company. Be careful here not to cite things that you have read on the on the website, that you know they're the best one or one of the best four financial companies in the UK, etc. This is about your unique reason why you're applying to them. So think about that. Write it in in your words to express that to communicate that strongly. And this is about your motivation because you'll be asked about why you're applying to them. This is um, to explain your motivation. Then moving on to paragraph three is to highlight your skills. So not all of them, but some of the um, most relevant skills to them and your, your strengths and what you can offer them from academia and from your work experience. And finally, a thank you and a closing if you're not available for an interview, um, etc. So the CV is, again, no longer than one page, and it's your unique chance, again, to show that creativity, to shine, to influence them, to make them curious about you, to invite you through to find out more. OK, so I think this summarizes all I have about CVs in the time given. Of course, we can talk here in a great length about CVs, but we don't have the time. If you would like any more advice, you can always book a one-to-one -one appointment with myself or a colleague, and we'll go through your CV. Ideally, we would like to see uh, your the job that you're applying for, so we can cross-reference and we can give you more detailed feedback. Um, but in the meantime, we can start off with, with that. Also to remind you that on the career development course, we have a unit specifically dedicated to writing CV, cover letters and LinkedIn profiles. It's worthwhile you undertaking that unit and doing the quiz at the end so that you get even more understanding and be even more confident about that CV writing. Thank you very much, Jaka. I thought that was very, very informative. I think that's helped me, even myself. And Georgia Rose was just saying that has been very helpful to her as well. Thank you very much. Um, just before we go into questions and answers, I just wanted to give a cheeky plug. Just a second. So we're currently working with we're currently working with Santander on a black inclusion program so if you identify as you know a black student they're running a scholarship program which which i thought was is very you know interesting so i'll put the link in the chat but you can have a look even though you're not you know even though you're not like an accounting or finance student you can still apply um to be part of that scheme and i, I just thought it would, it would be very helpful to students so i just thought to share that but i'll put the link in the chat um yeah otherwise we'll just stick around for um some questions if you've got any questions now is now is the time to ask could i ask a question yeah go on liza um, so a lot of the applications that i've been looking at for recently just for future use um they have like a bunch of questions specific to the actual job. And then on top of that, you can submit like your CV and whatever that may be. Does that, in that instance, would I have to send in a CV again specified to the job or would I just be sending in my CV 
as is, and then answering the question specific to the job. So the CV should be again tailored to that position. Okay. So again, look at the, the specific requirements, uh, the essential criteria and tailor the CV. So that's just the general rule because they don't want to be reading um, information that's not relevant to them. And also to avoid, um, you know, um, to, to, to save the time, employers don't have much time nowadays and also to facilitate your shortlisting, making it easier for them to shortlist you. Give them what they're looking for and you can't go wrong. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stroka. Did anyone else have a question? I did. Um, I just popped one in the chat though. So sorry. <laughs> okay. So Georgia Rose is saying I had a feedback. I had feedback on my CV that said I use passive language too much when talking about my achievements. I had to leave halfway through for another meeting. Well, please, could you advise on what classes? What classes as passive language? I was just going to say, if you did cover that, I'm really sorry I had to leave halfway through, but um, if you could go over it, that would be amazing. Yeah, sure. I spoke more about the positive language, the use of action verbs, um, not so much the, the passive. I don't know about your CV. Generally, things, words like um, possibility is considered as passive, instead opportunity. Um, so I don't know about your CV specifically, um, but these are the kind of words. And um, if you use the action verbs that I mentioned earlier, um, you know, these will demonstrate that a positive contribution, that impact, and that is considered as a positive language. So maybe we can have a look at that if you'd like to book an appointment or send your CV across so we can specifically look at the, the choice of words. Um, but it is very important. This is the first impressions that you're creating. So um, you have to, to use that advantage and 